Hello everyone, this is Dimitri from Nutsus Games, and welcome back to part 6 of our ongoing devlog series where we're going to be porting our Unity game, Hate Me Not, to Godot. Last week, we've made a lot of progress and we're going to show you this in the first part of this devlog, and in the second part, I'm going to show you how we managed to do data binding, which is going to significantly decrease our development time. Basically, we're going to be fast, faster than Sonic when it comes to developing our UI. Hopefully, it's going to amaze you as much as it did myself when I managed to implement this monstrosity, let's say. Basically, it's a kind of like a Chimera from C Sharp, NGD scripts kind of mixture thing, which allows you to have static types in the backend with events that automatically connect to UI elements in the front end by just specifying a path. So I'm just going to show you this. This hopefully is going to be very inspiring for you as well, because yeah, I'm just very happy we managed to do this. This, this is definitely going to be a nice improvement for my girlfriend also, because she's just started using GDScript and stuff like that. So she will be very easily able to connect UI elements to the backend. So let's show you first what we did last week, and then we're going to show you this awesome data binding thing because yeah, I'm so excited about it. So this was the state last week. You have the character, you can move around, look around with your mouse and move from the left side to the right side, from the right side to the left side. And basically very, very basic stuff up until now. The UI is also existing here, but it's not implemented yet. And now we fast forward to today. And this is the state today. Drum roll, please. Full screen and we have a working wave management thing here. We started wave one with three enemies. They're starting to come. We are, can shoot them. They get destroyed. If they hit the thing here, we lose health. There's animations here. The UI is working nicely. We can pick up ammo. This stuff is animating as well here. And the thing is shooting at us, which is stunning us and playing a... Okay, this needs to be fixed. But um, yeah, basically a lot of the things are working now and we can focus now on finalizing the content and porting really the things that are left, which are like few weapons and few more enemies. And yeah, there's still some systems missing, but the main part is done. So this is nice because we can now also play the game a little bit while we're developing it. So next step are going to be to port more things over, polish a little bit the UI, add these gems here. There's going to be some particle systems that we need to still add and a game of end screen and stuff like that. But yeah, this is nice. And now I want to go to the next topic, which is data binding. This is, yeah, this is so cool. My goal was to make it as easy as possible to access data from the backend in the front end. This was the goal. Hopefully it should have been possible without any kind of coding. And the result is following. Let's go right into Godot. So let's take the ammo thing, for example. When you pick up ammo, then this thing is refreshing. When you shoot it, it's also refreshing. And how does it work? Basically, the ammo label has a script attached to it. This script is called UI label, and it's the simple one. What it does is you give it a path for the text. So basically we want from the player the ammo. This is notated with this kind of arrow thing and it inserts it into this text template where value is. So basically it checks here, uh, goes to this ammo property. It uh, subscribes to the event of this ammo property. Initially it loads the default value or the initial value of it and then it updates every time this ammo property is updated on the player object. This path is created with the uh, C-sharp attributes, and I'm gonna show you this part in a little bit, but basically this is all that is necessary in order to connect the backend player ammo thing to this UI label. That's it. You don't need to do anything more, but I can see you're already typing in the comments that this thing is a very static number here and what, do you, what are you going to do if you want to have even more values? And for that I created a little bit more of an advanced script and attached this to this wave label here because this is a much more complicated object. Basically what we want to have here is if there is a timer for the wave, then we want to display the timer. If there is no timer for the wave, we want to show the number of enemies we have killed slash 
the number of enemies that have spawned so that you know how many you have killed out of the all of them that have that are going to be spawning and this logic is looking a little bit more complicated of course but it's of course a more complicated scenario and still i think this is readable and it's worth the effort that this is basically zero code so what are we doing here basically we have four different data binded attributes here now we have from the wave manager the wave we have from the wave manager the timer we have the wave manager max number of enemies to spawn and the max number of enemies that we have already killed and we can insert them with the squarely brackets here anywhere in this text basically anywhere we just need to use the same name that we have here as the after arrow denoted part of this ring and it's gonna substitute it automatically whenever it's changed whenever it's initially loaded all through the events so it's very performance and you can even do custom inline calculations so basically you could say for example i just don't want the wave to be there i want the wave times five or the wave squared this kind of things are possible this is really interesting and this is only possible by using the expressions class from godot and it does all of this fancy calculation things unfortunately the expressions cannot do if statements but i used regular expressions to parse a possible if statement this is basically my own syntax and it works following like if then some kind of condition then some kind of value else some other kind of value and you can do very basic operations here like for example stringifying things like the integer of the number of enemies killed you can add strings together this is also possible you can do a custom method so format time does not exist in any kind of context it doesn't exist like here in gdescript it doesn't exist in c sharp but i just wrote inside of my label wave sorry my ui label advanced c sharp script a custom method that takes a float and converts it into this notation that we see here which is like some kind of number double points some kind of numbers which is two digit and is um, divided and modulo by 60 so that we can have the minute and seconds counter here and this is working i i don't know this is just so much easier personally and for anybody who has no experience with uh, C Sharp or GDScript and they don't need to make every time a custom script and they don't need to do any kind of fancy stuff. This is all that's required here. I think this is cool. And you can also use this and this is kind of like the most overkill thing that's probably gonna be possible with this to modify values of generally controls. Like here this bar, this ammo bar is also using a data binding to change its minimum size and by that then it automatically adjusts whenever the ammo is updated i'm really really happy about the result it's not ready to be like a publicly available plugin or something like that it's there's still a lot of stuff we need to improve uh, but the basics and the even that the possibilities there for us is really really useful and our workflows really benefit from this i'm not sure if your workflow would benefit from this maybe but for now we are still not ready yet to to bring it out to the world because there is a lot of missing documentation and a lot of the smaller things that are not so let's say convenient to use right now but once we have the thing in a way that we can reuse it also in the future projects then maybe it would be nice to also just open source it that would be nice so now that you're a little bit curious on how it works on the backend side there's not much needed to do and i'm just going to show you so let's take for example the property ammo there are two things that we needed to do number one is create a bindable this is a custom class and then denote what kind of data type we wanted to have so it's going to be a bindable of type float and we are initializing here the default value which is 30 and then add data binding and this is the path then that it's going to be used as the context of the model so this is the part that we would in the ui reference before the arrow notation and then when we use the arrow notation we can 
directly say this name of the property. So this would be how you would then use it in the UI. We saw that earlier. And in the backend, you just say, this is the name of the model. This is the name of the property inside of it. It's gonna be automatically fetched. And there is one more thing you need to do in order to register this as a global model. You need to call data binding manager, which is a custom class, process data bindings, and then insert there as a parameter the object you want to process the data bindings and make the global context. This is one of the things that we want to improve and hopefully to only require one thing to be done, basically set up the data binding here with a bindable property. And here, by the way, we are in the wave manager. We have many more bindable properties. We have the wave, we have the number of enemies killed, max number of enemies to spawn and the timer here. And the timer is also one thing that we can do is basically a custom bindable thing. So this specifically is even a more advanced thing you can inherit from bindable and then you have all of the access to the bindable methods here like for example you can change the two strings so that it gets evaluated differently when it gets converted to a string or you can custom do your own value updated stuff you can you, you have really a lot of possibilities here and this can be improved i think still a lot there is still so many things we want to add here so that we can flexibly analyze and change all of the values of the controls and stuff like that so this is still kind of like a prototype of a concept that could become the fancy data binding and i think the potential is there at least for us it's really really helpful in order to just make the ui faster and have everything working out of the box so yeah that, that's that's the data binding basically so what do you think about the system i'm really really curious because I am not sure if all of the ways we did the stuff here are best practice or if there's maybe some better ideas or concepts, maybe that some that are already out of the box working with Godot. I know about signals, but I'm not 100% sure how to use them in order to create this thing also so dynamically with very simple you know, notation and stuff like that. Maybe it's possible also, but maybe I'm just also a very, uh, let's say, C-sharp type of person. But in any case, I really am curious about your opinion and hope hopefully that you enjoyed this video. If you like what we're doing here and porting our Unity game to Godot, then please leave a like and subscribe to our channel. We're gonna be keeping posting here our devlog series. We're gonna show you what we're doing behind the scenes, what our workflows are step by step, any kind of funny or cool feature we're gonna find out. And this kind of like harmonic cooperation between GDScript and C Sharp this is, these are the kind of stuff that I think are going to be nice here for us to just provide a little bit of our insights, feedback, maybe also learn from you as well. So yeah, I don't want to say anything more. It's getting late. Um, see you in the next one and have a nice day. Bye.